My grandmother lives alone. It's been that way since my grandpa died back when I was 17, and she's always done fine taking care of herself. At 87, she has her shit together better than my parents do, than I do, and I've never seen signs of her slipping into getting senile or Alzheimer's or whatever. At least that's what I always thought, until six months ago when I was back home. Dad was having back surgery, and I flew back for a few days to be around and help out, though everything went smooth enough that I wasn't really needed after all. But my last full day with my parents, I was getting bored and decided to go visit my grandmother. She was an hour away, but that was still way closer than when I lived two states over. Mom warned me before I went. She's starting to get strange, she said. Not to the point that they thought she was unsafe, but weird. When I asked her what she meant, she just shrugged and gave me a smile. You'll see. Maybe. Or maybe she'll just be normal today. Driving up the interstate, I felt my stomach nodding a little. I wanted to see her. I did, but I was worried that what I'd find was some crazy old woman where my sweet grandmother used to be. I felt selfish for having those reservations, but it didn't change how I felt. Still, Mom had told her that I was coming, and she was apparently happy that I was visiting, so that was a good sign. And driving down the streets leading to her house, I couldn't help but get swept up in a bit of nostalgia of the days I'd spent there growing up. The neighborhood was much the same, if older and a bit run down in spots. Stores had changed or closed, and some of the houses had for sale signs out front before you turned onto her street. Everything was different after that turn, though. All the lawns were mowed, and most of the houses looked freshly painted or renovated. Even some of the driveways looked newly paved. I made it to my grandmother's house, which was in good shape overall. Look a bit faded and shabby by comparison. The old woman was sitting on the front porch, looking a bit faded herself. It had been a couple of years since I'd seen her in person, and while she looked like herself, she seemed paler and thinner than I'd remembered. Smaller. Her hair was a wispy cloud of silvery gray, floating around a face that looked tired until you saw her eyes. <laughs> I felt myself smiling and tearing up a little as I met those eyes, still as sharp and bright as ever when she let out a small, delighted laugh. I went onto the porch and she stood up slowly to hug me. It's good to see you, girl. Pulling back, I grinned at her. It's good to see you too. Sorry it's been so long. I felt pressure against my shins and heard a grunting growl. Looking down, I saw her little mixed terrier, Junie, staring up at me with dark, sad eyes. I missed you too, Junie. She started wagging her tail, even as her master was waving away my apology. You're young and living your life. Don't ever apologize for that. Just glad to see you, so come on inside. She had made sandwiches and baked a pie, and by the time we got done with lunch, I felt like I might pass out or puke from all I'd eaten. Going into the living room, I flopped down on the sofa as I pondered what else to tell her now that I'd caught up on my job and how I liked living in the big city. It was then that it struck me how little she told me about how she was doing, even when I asked. She seemed fully herself, but she was vague and brief whenever I asked about something, and I didn't want her to feel like I wasn't interested in whatever she had going on. Are you still part of that book preservation club thing? My grandmother raised an eyebrow and laughed. <laughs> At the library? Yes, though it's hardly worth the effort anymore. Last few years, bored soccer moms are coming in and trying to take it over. They want to make it about parties and socializing instead of saving old books. She snickered. A couple of them pray for me to die at least once a week. I snorted. <laughs> I doubt that. She grinned. Oh, I wouldn't. I have a lot of time on my hands. I can be a stubborn old cunt when I'm in the mind to be. I was taking a sip of ginger ale when she said the last, and some of it shot out of my nose. What the... She flapped her hand at me. And I know your generation sees and does way worse than saying cunt. I was crying with laughter now. S stop, please, just stop saying it. Cunty, cunty, cunt. There. It's out of my system, at least for now. Wiping my eyes, I shook my head at her. <laughs> Fuck, 
asked me. Her eyes narrowed. Language, young lady. And she broke into a smile. So what else have you been up to? I shrugged. Nothing too much. Mainly working. What about you? Aside from pissing people off about old books, how have things been around here? Neighborhood still seems nice. The smile fell off her face so fast that I barely held in a gasp. Was something wrong? Was she getting sick? Or The neighborhood isn't nice at all anymore. It's been taken over. I felt my stomach tighten. I didn't know what she was talking about, but I really hoped she wasn't about to go into some prejudiced old person rant. Never thought she was like that, but maybe that's what Mom had been talking about. Wincing inside a little, I forced myself to ask the question. What do you mean, taken over? She stared at me for several moments and then shook her head. No, there's no need. No need to ruin this nice visit, especially when you'll just think I'm crazy. I frowned at her. No, I won't. What do you mean? I've lived in this neighborhood for over 50 years. Harris and I built this house right after getting married. Back then, it was only the second house on the street. We raised your mother and your uncles in this house, and then you came and stayed with us plenty of times when you were old enough. My Harris, well, when his heart gave out in the middle of the night, it was back in that bedroom where we've slept most of our lives. I don't... I don't say any of that to be overly sentimental, though I know I'm prone to that more and more as I get older. But no, I say it in part to explain why this place, this house, yes, but also this neighborhood, means so much to me. It makes me protective of it and unwilling to leave. But more than that, I want you to understand that I don't just love this neighborhood, I know it. I've seen dozens of families come and go up and down the street over the years, with very few exceptions. I've made a point to become their friend. When they leave, I still keep in touch with most of them. And those that stay, well, no one's been here as long as I have, I don't suppose. But I've known some of these people for 20 or 30 years. Not just them as friends, but by what I see of them day to day. Their habits, their comings and goings, for years I've made watching this street a passing hobby of mine. And there's little that goes on that I don't notice. Still, I'm not sure when it started. It's a subtle thing, especially nowadays. People spend so much time inside and isolated, after all. When we were younger, they'd regularly be neighborhood barbecues or potlucks. Just excuses to get together more than anything. That doesn't really happen anymore, and that's not what I'm talking about. No, I think it started with the Rosins not coming out of their house anymore. They've been here for almost 30 years, and I know she's been in bad health the last few, but that's never stopped either of them from feuding around the yard in the morning and walking around the neighborhood in the evening. When I first noticed all that had stopped, I thought maybe they were sick. I tried calling once, but I got their answering machine. When it hit me a few days later that I still hadn't heard back from them or seen them, I decided to go over and check for myself. Knocked on the door, I could hear something moving on the other side. They have wood floors, so I could hear them creaking, like weight was shifting as someone walked on them. Still, no one came to the door. I wound up leaving a little note saying that I hoped they were okay and to let me know if they needed anything. I thought about calling again or even asking the police to do a check on them, but I held off. I hadn't seen any signs of a problem from my limited vantage point. There were no signs of piled up mail as there might be if they were in the hospital or laying dead or injured in the house. No, I told myself I was being a stereotypical old busybody and I needed to leave well enough alone. That's when the family across from me stopped going outside. The Jeffords are a younger couple with a toddler. They'd only been over there for three years, but between the child and their busy work schedules, they were in and out of the house all hours of the day. And suddenly they were nowhere to be seen. And then it was the Kim family three doors down, and over time it became the whole street. I know how that sounds. 
An entire neighborhood has just disappeared. That's crazy. It's also not exactly what I'm saying. Because they... Because something is still out there. Sometimes the cars move or are gone. Not nearly as much as usual, but then only... A few of these houses are owned by younger people that still work. Still, the Jeffords. He works as an engineer at the base, and she's a dermatologist. Not jobs you can do from home. And one of their cars is almost always there now. There are other examples too, but you get the point. Things were getting strange. It was like returning to how things were during the COVID lockdown in many ways, but even then, we would see each other outside sometimes and talk at a distance. Now, there are signs of life, the repairs and upkeep, the cars moving some, that kind of thing, but I almost never see the people anymore. I wasn't the only one that noticed it, by the way, but the others disappeared too. After nearly six months, I'd gone from mildly curious to concerned to truly afraid. My attempts at making contact, phone calls, texts, notes, going and knocking on their doors had all gone unanswered. And I was far past the point of thinking it was a coincidence or something wasn't going on. Still, I was slow to act because I was afraid. Afraid of calling attention to myself. Afraid of what might happen if I made too much of a fuss. Afraid of calling attention to myself. Afraid of what might happen. Afraid of calling attention to myself. Afraid of what might happen if I made too much of a fuss. Afraid of looking crazy if there was some innocent explanation for it all. For several weeks I tried to ignore it, but my conscience kept whispering that I was being a coward, that these were my friends and that they needed my help. So I called the police. I didn't want it linked back to me, so I went to the store and bought a couple of those disposable cell phones. I used them to call 911 a few days apart, first to check on a family down on the other end of the street. They were always running around like the Jeffords, and I hadn't seen them in over a month. Second call was for the Rossons. Both times I refused to give my name, but I asked for them to check in on them, which they did. I lived too far at the wrong angle to see anything but distant flashing lights when they checked on that first family, but I could clearly see when they went into the Rosson house. No lights this time, but I watched through my blinds as two officers got out and went up to the front door and knocked. There was no answer at first, and another round of knocks, I was starting to wonder if they would actually try to go inside or just report it as... The door opened. The afternoon was growing dark, and there was some distance away, but I could see a person that looked like Anna Rosin standing in the doorway, gesturing as she talked to the officers. Should have made me feel better, but it didn't. Even at a distance, seeing that figure in the door made my stomach clench, though it wasn't until an hour later that I understood why. Just after sunset, my doorbell rang. Looking through the peephole, I saw Anna Rostin's face staring back at me. Sucking in a breath, I forced a smile and opened the door. Hey Anna, this is a surprise. The woman's face split into a version of my own smile as she gave a nodding laugh. Yes, it's been too long, hasn't it? We've been meaning to come by or call. We got your sweet note, by the way. Just, well, you know how it is. Time gets away from all of us, I guess. Uh, yes, it does. Though I'm glad to see you're doing okay. Arthur's too, I hope. I was trying to keep the tremor out of my voice and thought I was mostly succeeding, though every second looking at her made me feel like something was crawling up my throat trying to escape in a scream. The thing nodded again. Oh, yes. He putters around the house constantly, and frankly, it gets on my nerves, but I don't know what I'd do without him. I swallowed. Good. Uh, I just... Well, I saw there were police over there today, and I wanted to make sure one of you hadn't had an accident or something. Her lips twitched slightly. Yes, I guess someone felt they needed to check on us. I wish I knew who, just so I could probably thank them for being so sweet. Her eyes drifted off for a second before coming back to me. But don't you worry about us, okay? 
Everything's as right as rain, and I promise that. Before you know it, we'll be back over here visiting you. I had to fight from slamming the door shut then, but I forced myself to say I looked forward to seeing her again. She gave a little laugh as she turned and started back the way she had came. I watched for several seconds, oddly fascinated, as I watched her cross my yard and head down to the Rossens' house, every step just reinforcing what I'd known from the moment I'd opened the door. That wasn't Anna Rossen. It looked like her, sure. The face was very similar, as was the body, height, voice, all of it were close enough that most people would meet the thing on my porch and think it was just an attractive older lady, but for someone that had known her for as long as I had, everything was slightly off. Her skin looked different. Similar, yes, but it hung differently and was paler and slightly sallow. Her voice was almost the same, but it was deeper, and I remembered it as certain words carried around at edges of an accent that Anna didn't have. But the most obvious thing was how she moved. Walking, of course, but also her expressions and gestures. My first confused thought when I opened the door was that this was Anna's sister, but as we talked, a new and terrifying thought quickly formed. It was something trying to pretend like it was Anna. The fact that it was doing such a good job just made me more afraid. I stared at my grandmother. So, what? You think someone did something to your neighbor and now is impersonating them? How? And even if they could, why? Her troubled expression darkened slightly as her brows furrowed. I don't know why or how. I don't know much beyond that it's clearly happening. Shaking my head, I leaned forward as I gave her a frown. How do you know she wasn't just sick and looked and sounded a bit different? My grandmother laughed bitterly. (laughs) Because it's not her. It's all of them. Everyone. Except for you. She sighed. (sighs) Yes. I know how it sounds. I knew this was a mistake. No. No, I'm... I'm not saying you're crazy, but I don't understand yet. How do you know it's all of them? Because you haven't been seeing them? Raising her eyebrows, she went on. Not just because everyone started disappearing, but because of how they reappeared. After the thing that looked like Anna came to visit, I started devoting all my time to watching the neighborhood, both trying to understand what was happening to watch out for any unwanted visitors coming my way. And do you know what I saw? What? People. I'd look out and see the Jeffords coming and going, or the Kims pushing a stroller down the street. Not all the time, but way more than I'd been seeing before. Of course, I knew what it was. What, what was? This change where people were back outside again. I could hear the heat of anger in her voice as she continued. It was all a show. All for me. To fool me into thinking things were still normal until they decided to come and collect me. What? Why do you think that? Her smile was cold. Because there's only ever two of them. This has been going on for weeks now. I honestly thought they would have got me before, but I don't understand anything they do. What I do know is that out of this entire neighborhood, you will never see more than two people out at the same time. Maybe together, or opposite ends of the street, but it will always be two people or less. It's like... She swallowed. It's like there's only two of them, and they're having to change costumes to look like there's more. Just to what... Confuse me? Pacify me? Or just because they think it's fun? My grandmother had been staring down at her hands while she spoke, but now she looked back up to me. What happens when they get bored of it? I sat, staring back at her, unsure of what to do or say. Finally, I just asked her if she felt safe there, or like she needed to come home with me. Her laughter had some warmth this time. (laughs) No, honey. Though I appreciate the thought. Safe or not, this is my home. 
I'm not going to run from it if I can help it. She reached out and plucked a small silver revolver from under the sofa cushion beside her. And if they do try to come in on me, I won't go easily. My eyes widened. Jesus, be careful with that. She grinned. Don't worry. I'm old, not a fool. I've used guns since I was a little girl and I know a gin shoots. Her smile quickly fell away. And I do thank you for listening to me. Not because I'm asking for help, but because it's good to have someone actually listen instead of just nodding along until they can interrupt. You're a sweet girl. Tearing up a little, I went over and gave her a hug. I... I don't know that I believe all that you're saying, but I know it's been hard to go through, and I'm sorry for it. I forced a chuckle. <laughs> And I do kind of hope you're crazy, because that sounds terrifying. She laughed in my ear softly. <laughs> I've thought the same thing. Senility would be better than body snatchers, right? But I don't think it's as easy as all that. And Well, you need to get going. It'll be dark in half an hour, and I want you to get well away from here. I was really upset on my drive back to my parents, but I kept everything to myself despite my mother's questions about how the trip had gone. I didn't know what I believed, and I didn't want my grandmother thinking I went back saying that she was crazy or something, so instead I went back home the next day and after that I'd call and check on my grandmother every couple of weeks. Neither of us mentioned what we'd talked about that day, and my grandmother never questioned why I suddenly called her with some regularity. We'd just chat a few minutes. She'd tell me she was doing okay, and that was that. Until the next phone call. And then she stopped answering the phone. I could have called my parents, of course. They were way closer, and if I'd let them know I was worried, they would have driven over right away. Yet something stopped me from doing that. They didn't know I was calling and checking in on her, after all. There'd be more questions if they suddenly found out. It might sound silly, but that felt like a betrayal. She had trusted me with her fears, and I owed it to her to check on things before I started announcing her strange stories to the world. So I got on a plane and flew back in that night. It was after nine before I made it to her house, and the street was dark aside from the occasional street light or lit window pane in some neighbor's house down the street. Just like before, I saw no people out, and when I reached my grandmother's house, it looked as dark and quiet as a tomb. Stomach clenched, I went up to the porch and knocked on the front door. I hoped for shuffling footsteps, or at least Junie barking up a storm, but there was nothing. Part of me was in surprise. I'd called ten times since first missing her that morning, after all. Turning around, I looked out at the dark row of houses. Still, what did that leave? Did I call my parents, the cops? She could be laying in there dead. But wouldn't the dog at least make noise? And what if she was right about the neighbors? It seemed impossible, but... What if she was right? I gritted my teeth. <laughs> no, that was crazy. These were just people, and wherever my grandmother was, a doctor's appointment, the hospital, the grocery store, it wasn't some sinister plot. I was stupid, so I just... I was just going to go over and ask one of them for help. I realized I was holding my breath and forced myself to let it go. Shit, fuck. Okay, I was going to call mom before I went over. Hey honey, everything okay? Uh, yeah. Uh, probably. Look, I got worried about grandma, so I came over and I'm checking on her. You... What? You're back since when? Just now? Like, tonight? 
I know, it's weird. I'll explain later, but I'm about to go ask the neighbors if they've seen her because I can't get her to come to the door. We'll start coming, right? No. No, just... Let me check. It'll take too long for you to get here. I'm just... I'm about to ask one of the neighbors, uh, the, the Rosins. They're across the street. If I don't get an answer, I'm calling you back and heading that way. But if you don't hear from me in 30 minutes, you call the cops and send them over here, okay? I, I, I don't. Just do it, okay? Promise? Yes, I, I promise, but I... Okay. I'm going now before I lose my nerve. I love you. Talk to you in a few minutes. The Rosins, remember. My skin was prickled and tangling as I stepped out onto the asphalt and started crossing over, walking faster through the patches of shadow despite my resolution to stay calm and not freak myself out until I knew something was really wrong. The exterior of the Rosin house was fresh and clean, with a well-manicured lawn and healthy trimmed bushes lining both sides of the walk up to the front door. I hesitated for a moment when I raised my hand to knock, my first trembling like a question mark before finally coming down once, twice, three times. I waited. Straining to hear something, anything, from either behind the door or somewhere out in the night surrounding me. At first there was nothing, and after what felt like a full minute of waiting, I was debating either knocking again or going ahead and running back to my car. But then I heard it. A distant creak of wood, like someone walking up steps and then a door squeaking open, and then shut, and then softer footfalls as it approached the front door and opened it. Hello, my dear. I blinked as I stared at the woman standing in front of me. I didn't know what Anna Rosin looked like, but this wasn't that different from what my grandmother had described. Attractive, older, long brown hair, and her expression wasn't unpleasant. Politely inquisitive came to mind. And yet, I suppressed a shiver as I forced a smile. Hello, ma'am. Are you Anna Rosin? The woman quirked a smile. That's what they call me. Uh... My grandmother, Mrs. Springer, she lives across the street down to the end of the street there. I think you know her, right? The woman nodded, her smile fading away. Oh, yes, I love Matilda. Is everything okay? I just... Well, I hope it is. I haven't been able to get a hold of her and with a... Uh, with her being older and all, I just wanted to make sure she was okay, but she didn't answer the door. Her eyes widened slightly as she nodded. Oh, you poor dear. Come in, come in. I felt a level of fear and revulsion at the invitation as I took an involuntary step back. Oh, I don't want to be a bother. She shook her head. Nonsense, no bother at all. Come in and I'll help you find what's going on. This was stupid. The woman was a little weird, maybe, but she was being perfectly nice. Stepping forward, I couldn't help but add. Just for a moment, I called my parents and told them I was coming over here, and if I don't call them back with, with some news about my grandmother soon, they'll get worried and send someone. I thought I saw the woman pause as she was turning to move further into the hall, but if so, it was... Only a moment before she flashed me another smile. Of course, we wouldn't want that. Give me just a minute. Your grand gave me a key to her house in case of an emergency. This was years ago, so I have to go find it, but it won't take too long. It's upstairs. You can just wait here. Sh sure. I clasped my hands together to keep them from trembling as I watched her go down the hall and turn into what must be a stairwell. As I heard her footsteps creaking as she went up to the second floor. 
I needed to chill out. This was all just some kind of mis... But those hadn't been stairs she'd used before. My mind was jittering fast and sharp, jumping tracks from placating me to pointing out something I'd missed at first. Those sounds of her coming to the door, they'd come from the left and from down. A basement, maybe. Looking down the hall, I saw a closed door on the left side. So what? I can't go check it. What if she comes back? She has nothing to hide. At most, I'll get scolded for being rude. Another part of my mind piped up. And if Grandma's right, you're trapped down there if she finds you. This was followed by a third thought, each word piercing me as it sounded in the caverns of my brain. If you're right, Grandma and Junie need your help. Fuck. Walking quietly as I could, I eased over the door and tried the knob. It opened easily, squeaking softly even with my efforts to be slow and gentle. The wooden steps led down into a dark abyss, leaving the door partially open for the light, even though I knew it would be obvious if I didn't beat her back up to the main floor. Just a quick look and I'm done. Grandma! Junie! I gave my voice a harsh whisper, but it sounded loud in the black, and in the small light from my phone barely reached the wall at the bottom of the stairs. Still, it looked like a normal basement. I walked on down to the bottom, panning around at the rest of the space. Washer and dryer, shelves of books, cardboard boxes... A giant hole in the far wall? What the... Hard hammering, I stepped closer. It wasn't normal construction, but it wasn't normal decay either. Instead, it looked like someone had torn out a 5 by 2 section of wall. No, maybe it was pushed in from the outside, because I could see bits of concrete and dirt scattered across the floor like there had been a small explosion at some point. And beyond that hole, it was a tunnel. Where'd you go, dear? Down into the dark? Do you think your sweet granny is down there? There was no real thought in what I did next. It was just fear, blind panic, fear and instinct that sent the tunnel, unknown and terrifying as it was, had to be better than staying where I was. It wasn't until I was plunging into that that I realized something had briefly caught my hair, the hand of some second creeping stranger, maybe before my speed and momentum tore me free. Glancing back with the light, I caught a glimpse of movement, even as I heard her coming down the stairs quickly. Oh god, there really were two of them. I turned back to running, hunched and gasping through the tunnel as it twisted some one way in the other before splitting into several branches. It goes all over, all over the neighborhood, and I didn't know which way to... Reaching into my pocket, I pulled out my keys. I didn't know how far away I was exactly, or if the signal would go through that much earth, but I had to try. Maybe it would get someone's attention at least. I hit the panic button once, twice, three, four times, looking behind me for pursuers while straining for any sign of my alarm. I couldn't wait here any longer, or they just... Wait. I heard it. I picked the tunnel that seemed the closest to the direction of my car alarm, moving faster and faster as I heard myself pass the alarm overhead. The tunnel opened into another room, though this one wasn't entirely dark. At both ends were little duck nightlights, after all. My grandmother had put them down here after I got scared in the basement once, when I was eight or nine. I remember her hugging me as Grandpa put the nightlights in the next day. She told me I never had to worry again because the ducks would always be down here to protect me. Now that farther duck lit a length of cloth, some kind of thick canvas maybe, and on it were two spread out mounds of skin and hair shaking. I held up my flashlight's light to see it all clearly. One mound was much larger. The skin was pale and wrinkled, like that of an old woman. And the other 
was just the color and texture of fur. The fur of a little terrier that my grandma had named Junie May. Oh, Jesus. There's a sound in the tunnels now. A slow, stealthy sound. But clear and coming closer. Forcing myself to turn from it, I ran to the stairs and up them. I slammed into the far wall when I went through the door up top, bouncing off it and running to the front door. Twisting the bolt and undoing the chain, I was opening it when I heard a voice behind me. Where are you going? Didn't you come to visit? Come here so we can talk? Turning back, I saw my grandmother's face peering from around the edge of the basement door. Her cheek was drooping slightly until something underneath twitched it into place. Behind her, a watery sound that slowly became the excited bark of a small dog. You fuckers. Go fuck yourselves. I slammed the door behind me, leaping off the porch and getting into my car as fast as possible for punching the button and throwing the car into reverse. I sped out of the neighborhood as fast as my car would go, and I didn't slow down until I was on the interstate making a crying phone call to my mother. I don't blame her for being confused. I was hysterical, sobbing, and anything she could understand would have sounded crazy. She said they'd meet me halfway at a gas station in between. I was still terrified of being run off the road or snatched at any moment, but I didn't want to lead them to my parents' house either, so I agreed. When he got there, after I hugged them and calmed down enough to explain what happened, to explain all of it, they called the police. The version my father told them was a very pared down version of what I'd said, and I could tell they thought I was in shock and talking out of my head, but they could also see how dirty and upset I was that something had happened, and they'd had no luck calling my grandmother either. So instead, my father said his little girl had gone over to see her grandmother, and she couldn't find her, and something had happened while she was there, and maybe I'd been attacked. He told me and mom to go in their car to the police station while he went out and met the cops at grandmother's house. I tried to get him not to go, but he insisted, and he was about to leave when 911 called him back. They told him to go with us to the police station instead of coming there. When he asked why, there was a pause, and then the woman on the other end of the line said it was because there was a fire there now, and it was too dangerous. We found out a couple of hours later that the fire wasn't just confined to my grandmother's house, but it was the entire neighborhood. Less than an hour after that, a chain of explosions linked to bad gas lines had detonated several of the homes, as well as large portions of the street as significant damage was done via underground lines as well. All told, every house on the block went up, and it was hours before the firefighters were able to get the flames under control. While it was presumed that many people have died, it's been a month and no bodies have been found. Weirdly enough, after my initial statement, no one has questioned me again or accused of me being involved. I don't hear anything about it on the news, and no one seems overly troubled that an entire street full of people seems to have up and vanished. Instead, everyone's calling it an accident, and seemed very interested in moving on. Almost everyone. Because last week, I got a call from a detective, Morris. I didn't answer at the time, because I'd been screening all my calls lately, but when I heard the voicemail, I looked him up before calling back. It was weird. He was a detective with the police departments, investigating the fires, but he was assigned to sexual assault cases, not murders or property crimes. On a whim, I googled his home address before calling him back. Hello? Hey, Detective Morris? You called me about that fire on my grandmother's street? Yeah, I did. I was hoping I could meet with you soon, show you something of interest. Hmm. And what's that? A tunnel. 
a partial underground tunnel that seems to run underneath your grandmother's neighborhood. Yeah, I bet. Detective. Yes? Do you live at 415 Jasmine Street? Uh, <laughs> yes, I do. The Jasmine Street that's less than 500 yards from the street my grandmother lived on. A pause and then... Yes, that's right. That's why I've taken a personal interest in the case. I need to show you what's in the tunnel. It's... Oh, it's really something. I told you before. Go fuck yourselves. <laughs>